محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, especially the leader of our time, the awaited savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us in this verse to make peace amongst the believers. The believers are brothers. Therefore, make peace amongst them. Bring them together. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Every prophet of God aimed at creating a harmonious society in which the believers treat one another as true brothers. Every prophet of God exerted so much effort to unite the hearts of the people, to bring the believers closer to one another. This was their dream. This was their vision. This was their objective. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when he migrated from the city of Mecca to the city of Medina, the way in which he achieved success in establishing a Muslim community was by bringing the believers close to one another. By uniting their hearts. When the Prophet arrived in Medina, one of the first things that he did was to create a spirit of brotherhood amongst the believers. There were two groups of Muslims at the time. The Muhajireen and the Ansar. The Muhajireen are those who migrated from Mecca to Medina with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The Ansar were the people of Medina who hosted the Prophet. Now the Muhajireen, when they left Mecca and migrated to Medina, they had nothing with them. They left their homes, their wealth, their property, their work, their life. They came to Medina empty-handed. The pagans did not allow them to take anything with them. Imagine this group of believers, of Muslims, arriving in Medina not having anything. The Prophet, peace be upon him, encouraged the people of Medina to share their wealth with the people of Mecca, the Muslims who had come from Mecca. Many of these people in Medina truly showed their generosity. They gave their homes to those people, to the Muslims who had come from Mecca. They even asked some of their women to marry them. Some of them needed to establish a life, establish a family. They were willing to marry them. That's not easy. For someone to marry a person who has come from another city, you don't know anything about that person. You don't know anything about their tribe. And this person is poor, empty-handed. He has nothing, absolutely. But they sacrifice for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet, peace be upon him, created this amazing spirit of generosity by making the people of Medina brothers with the people of Mecca. The Prophet would, for example, 
approach one of his companions and he would tell him, today, from today, you are the brother of this other companion. He made them brothers of one another. The hadith tells us that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, made all of them brothers, only Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was left without a brother. Some companions were imagining why the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not assign anyone for Imam Ali. He himself, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, came to the Prophet. He told him, Ya Rasulullah, you assigned all Muslims brothers. You assigned this person, this brother, that person, so-and-so person. How come you did not assign anyone for me? The Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, Oh Ali ibn Abi Talib, I saved you for me. You shall be my brother and I shall be your brother. The Muslim community found strength in brotherhood. Through this spirit of brotherhood, they achieved success. They became a powerful force. However, unfortunately, after the Prophet, peace be upon him, until this very day, we see that the Muslim communities around, this, around the world have abandoned this very important responsibility. They have forgotten the values of brotherhood the values of true, genuine friendship, how to create compassion and love and harmony in our societies. One of the greatest and most important rights that we have as believers is to develop a true friendship with other believers in our societies. It is such an important right that we as believers must fulfill. Every single believer in your community has a right upon you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to treat one another as brothers. In one very beautiful hadith, one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq salam asks the Imam, he tells him, oh Imam, tell me, the believers in my society, what rights do they have upon me? What are my obligations towards them? Please tell me, explain to me. The Imam السلام, explains to him, he tells him, my dear companion, listen very carefully. These rights are extremely important. If you do not fulfill these rights, what happens? The Imam السلام, in this hadith says, Ya Mu'alla, the companion, his name was Mu'alla. In dhayya'a minha shay'an kharaja min wilayati Allahi wa ta'ati. The Imam tells him, oh Mu'alla, there are seven rights that you have to observe. If you do not observe any one of these rights, then you will be disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will exit from the obedience of God. Believers have a special relationship with God. A relationship of obedience. If the believers do not fulfill this responsibility, the Imam السلام, says, you will exit this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will no longer remain obedient to God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will no longer be your direct guardian. The one who will guide you through every step of your way. Mu'alla says to the Imam, my dear Imam, tell me, what are these rights? I want to know about them. The Imam told him, oh Mu'alla, inni la'alayka shafiq. I'm concerned about you. Akhaf an la tahfud wa tudayya'a hadihi al-haqoob. I am concerned, I'm afraid. If I tell you about these rights, you may not fulfill them. I'm concerned that if I tell you about these rights and you do not practice them, you'll be in trouble. Because now when you know something, when you have knowledge of something, if you do not fulfill it, it is a greater burden for the human being for him to know something and not to fulfill it. Yes, ignorance is not an excuse. People who are ignorant, the hadith tells us on the day of judgment, Allah will ask certain people, why did you not fulfill these obligations? 
they will respond and say, oh Allah, we did not know. We were unaware. We had no knowledge of these obligations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell them, Why didn't you learn? Why did you not seek knowledge? So ignorance is not an excuse. But if you know the obligations and you still do not fulfill them, then you absolutely have no excuse. The ignorant people, at least they can claim we were ignorant. We did not know. But the human being who knows of these obligations has no excuse whatsoever. The Imam is telling him, Oh Muhanna, I'm just concerned you may not fulfill these obligations. The Imam is bringing this matter to our attention that it is extremely important. For us to be true believers, we have to observe these very important rights. The Imam salam explains to him. He tells him, Oh Muhanna, let me tell you about the first right. This first right of the believers is concerned with our heart, my own heart. How should I position my heart with respect to other people? What is the attitude of my heart? You know, our hearts have attitudes. Our spiritual hearts have an attitude towards people. How should my attitude be towards other believers? The Imam salam tells him, the first one, the least of them, and to hibbalahu ma to hibbul nafsik, wa takraha lahu ma takraha nafsik. You should love for your brother what you love for yourself, and you should dislike for your brother what you dislike for yourself. This is the first right. When you think of the rights of believers and your obligations, Towards the believers, start with your heart. How do you feel about other believers? Do you have a positive attitude? Do you truly want the good for them, the best for them? Do you wish it for them, pray for them in your heart? It's extremely difficult to achieve this position. But narrations tells us that we cannot taste true faith without being in this position. It requires that we Get rid of any selfishness that exists in our hearts. To want the best for people, to love for them what you love for yourself, and to dislike for them what you dislike for yourself, this is not easy. This is one of the most difficult positions that a human being can ever achieve. It requires sacrifice. It requires humbleness. It requires respecting other people. This is the first right. Then the Imam السلام, moves on to the second right. The second right is concerned not with your heart. Now you've taken care of your own heart. You've given your heart the proper attitude. The second right is concerned with the heart of the believers. Now that you've fixed your own heart and you've positioned your heart properly, Next comes the role of the heart of the believer. How should you behave when it comes to the hearts of the believers? The Imam السلام, states, The second right is for you to avoid angering the believers. For you to genuinely seek the satisfaction of the believers in your society. That is extremely difficult. Once you've positioned your heart, you've prepared your heart to love for others what you love for yourself and to dislike for others what you dislike for yourself. The next step is now to go and establish a connection with those hearts. Find those hearts in society, brothers and sisters. The Imam is commanding us, if you want to achieve faith, be a true followers of the Imams, السلام, go find the believers, establish a genuine friendship with them, and make sure you do not anger them, you do not disappoint them, you do not harm or wrong them in any way, and strive to achieve their satisfaction. It is extremely difficult to achieve the satisfaction of the believers. Because you have to be very careful with what you say, 
with how you behave, with how you carry yourself, with your attitude. But this is a right that the Imam السلام, has imposed on us. It is one step that we need to take towards the path of righteousness. So the first right is concerned with your heart. The second right is concerned with the hearts of the believers. Once we have observed these two rights, the third right comes in. The Imam السلام, in this third right, he says, وَأَن تَكُونَ عَيْنَهُ وَدَلِيلَهُ وَمِرْآتَ Once the hearts are positioned properly, then comes the roles of your actions. You should be the eyes of the believers in society. You should be their guide and their mirror. Many people, especially these days, even the good ones who are striving to become believers, they will tell you that I've you know, struggled against my desires. I found the right path. And that's enough for me. I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to go after others in society, to help them, to be a guide for them, that's not really any of my business. My business is to take care of myself. But I don't have any obligations toward others. The Imam is telling us that we do have an obligation towards others. By being a guide for other people, I am worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the best act of worship for you to be a mirror for the believers. But what does that mean? What does a mirror do, I ask you? What is the role of a mirror? Why do we have them in our homes? You know, for many of the sisters, they carry them in their purse all the time. Why do we have a mirror? What is it good for? A mirror reflects to you your appearance. It shows you how you look. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't subtract anything. It shows you how you are. It gives you the reality. A believer should be the mirror of another believer. When a believer sees you, you should be able to reflect to them their qualities by constantly guiding them. When a believer does something wrong, when your brother does something wrong, point that out to them in a gentle way in a wise, appropriate way. That's how you become the mirror of that believer. When they're doing something right, encouraging, encourage them, help them, assist them. Be a participant with them in achieving that goodness in society. Otherwise, on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will hold us accountable. One narration illustrates to us this scene this very powerful scene on the Day of Judgment, a believer is passing on the bridge of Sarat, trying to make his way to paradise, when suddenly one of his friends grabs his feet. One of his friends who's falling into the hell, into the pits of the hellfire, grabs his feet. He tells him, let me go, I'm trying to find my way to paradise. Let go of me, what are you trying to do? He tells him, look, back in the world, you had the opportunity to guide me and save me from this hell, but you did not. He will grab you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable and responsible. We should be the guide for other people. In a very beautiful hadith, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi he says, Unsur akhaka zaliman wa mazluma. Help your brother, whether he is oppressed or he's an oppressor. Whether injustice is done to him or he's committing the injustice. Can you imagine? How would the Prophet, peace be upon him, ask us to help our brothers even if they are oppressing, even if they are committing an act of injustice? The companions were puzzled. They were surprised. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, the first part makes sense. If my brother is oppressed, I should help him. But the second part doesn't make sense. If the brother is oppressing, how do we help that person? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you help them by stopping them from committing the injustice. That's how you help them. 
If you see them doing something wrong, help them quit it, stop it. Change their path to the right path. That's how we help. Be a guide for the believers. Protect them in your society. Protect their dignity, protect their honor. It has been narrated that there was a respected scholar in Iran, one of the very well-known scholars decades ago. He was experiencing a problem in, his, in one of his eyes. So he goes to this very well-known surgeon or doctor who would treat his eye. Now this doctor or surgeon was a respectful individual in that society. He was a believer. And he was truly an expert in his field. Now once he performs the operation on the scholar, unfortunately the eye of the, of the scholar becomes blind. Not every operation succeeds. Yes, he was an expert, and he did his best, but unfortunately he ended up blinding the eye of the scholar. For many years this scholar lived without having anyone know that his eye was blinded. Not even his own family, not even his own sons realized this. He would behave in a way so as not to indicate to anyone that he had lost his eye. He acted as if he saw with both of them. Until one day, shortly before he was passing away, one of his sons realized that his father is having trouble seeing with one of his eyes. He asked him, Father, is there something wrong with your eye? Wasn't the operation successful? His father tells him, my dear son, I will tell you, but you have to promise not to say anything. Don't reveal this. I insist on you not to reveal this. He says, okay, I won't reveal it. He tells him, when I did this operation a while ago, this doctor ended up blinding my eye. But I did not say it to anyone, because I was concerned if the people of my society, if the people of my community come to know that this doctor has blinded the eye of this merger, of this great scholar, Imagine how people would view him. How many people would attack him. He would lose his dignity and his honor. And no one would go to him anymore. I wanted to protect his dignity. He's an expert. He did his best. I can't blame him. Mistakes do happen sometimes. Some operations are not successful. I wanted to protect his dignity. Look at the faith of this person. Look at the brotherhood that he carries in his heart. He went through the trouble of hiding this for so many years, even amongst his own family, in order to protect the dignity of one believer. Because this scholar was well aware of this right. And he knew that the dignity and the honor of a believer, according to one hadith, is greater in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the sanctity of the Kaaba. The believers have a truly high status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the third right. The fourth right that the Imam alayhi salam in this wonderful hadith expresses, the Imam beautifully says, وَإِنْ عَلِمْتَ أَنَّ لَهُ حَاجَةً تُبَادِرُهُ إِلَىٰ قَضَائِهَا If you realize that your brother in society needs something from you, is in need of your assistance, is in need of your help, then you take the initiative and go and fulfill that need. Don't allow for your brothers for them to come and ask you. You go to them before they come asking you. This is a right. The Imam says if you want to be a true believer and fulfill these rights, if you send someone in your community is in need of your help, you take the initiative. You go forward. Don't wait for them to come and ask you and beg you. Save their face. You take the initiative. Help other people. Be the source of their assistance. It has been narrated that once in one of the Muslim cities in the Middle East, there was a young man who had recently gotten married. He was struggling financially. 
One day his wife, his newlywed wife, told him that we don't have anything to eat today at home. There's nothing at home. Please go out. Do something. Provide a solution for this situation. He goes out in the streets. He doesn't know where to go. He couldn't find a job. He goes to a masjid. He was praying in that masjid. He realized that a very wealthy person, a businessman, walked into the mosque. This wealthy businessman starting to offer his salah. He was praying. Now this young man realized that this businessman was wearing a very valuable ring. A very valuable ring. And he realized that this man, this businessman, he took out the ring while he was doing the salah and he placed it on the ground, on the floor of the masjid. The shaitan comes to his mind. He tells him, this is your opportunity. If you can steal this ring somehow without this man realizing it, you can sell it and make a fortune out of it and all of your miseries will be solved. You can take some good food and take it home. He slowly, you know, inches across, crawls across towards this businessman who was offering his salah. And when this man goes into sujood, he snatches the ring. And then he slowly gets away from him. As he's about to exit, that businessman calls him. He yells at him. Imagine, he was frightened at this point. He got caught red-handed. He figured out that I stole this ring from him. The man told him, come here, I want to speak to you. So he goes to him, lowering his head, very ashamed of what he did, very embarrassed. The businessman told him, listen, I didn't call you to punish you. I don't want to punish you. That's not the reason why I've called you. You don't look like a thief. Especially from the way you took the ring, how obvious it was. I realized it was probably your first time. The young man says, I swear by God this was my first time in my life that I would steal anything. But I was desperate. I recently got married. We have nothing at home. My wife is pressuring me. Please forgive me. I've never stolen in my life. The businessman told him, I, th I think you're telling the truth, yes. But the reason why I called you is I wanted to give you my telephone number. He says, why? He told him, you don't know the value of this ring. This ring is an extremely valuable and expensive ring. Now you're going to take it to the market, to some jewelry shop to sell it. The owner of any store will immediately realize that you've stolen this ring. It doesn't belong to someone who looks like you. So I'm giving you my telephone number so that anyone has any doubts, if they want to refer you to the police for stealing it, they can call me and I will tell them that I gave you this ring. Look at the brotherhood, brothers and sisters. Look at the faith of this man. This young man says, I went to the market, I took out the ring and I told the owner of the shop that I wanted to sell this ring. Immediately the owner captured my arms and he was about to call the police. I told him, what are you doing? He says, you young man, that's obviously not your ring. Where did you get it from? You've probably stolen it from somewhere. He says, I took out the number. I told him, this businessman gave it to me. He called the businessman and then he confirmed that it was his. This is the brotherhood that we need to carry in our hearts in order to establish a truly harmonious society. One day, an Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam was in Mecca performing the tawaf around the Kaaba. He was with his companion, Aban ibn Taghlib. The Imam realized that Aban ibn Taghlib had a friend who was standing next to the Madaf, the area where the people circle around the Kaaba. And he was waving to him, signaling to him, trying to say something. But Aban would ignore him because he was performing his tawaf. And Imam al-Sadiq tells him, Aban, what does your friend want from me? What's going on? He tells him, Oh dear Imam, this is one of my friends. And he wants me to help him with something. He needs me. But I'm doing my tawaf. I can't stop my tawaf and go to him. The Imam salam, tells him, Oh Iman, oh, oh Aban, stop your tawaf right now and go help your brother. 
Adam tells him, oh Imam, but this is my wajib tawaf. It's mandatory. It's part of hajj. How can I stop it and end it? The Imam says, go, I tell you, end your tawaf right now. Help him and then come back. We do your tawaf. Oh, Aban, do you know that your friend has a right over you? Go and fulfill that right. Another right that the Imam السلام, speaks about in a very beautiful narration is the obligation of constantly keeping in touch with the believers. Constantly you have to keep in touch with them. Specifically, the Imam expects us to visit one another. Do you know how valuable it is for believers to visit one another? Let me recite this hadith for you. In this hadith, Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi states, مَنْ زَارَ أَخَاهُ فِي اللَّهِ فِي مَرَضٍ أَوْ صَحَّةٍ If you visit your friend, your brother, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of Allah, whether your friend is sick or he is in good health, if you visit them, but with certain conditions, the Imam says, لا يأتيه خداعا ولا استبدانا. If you visit your friend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for your own personal interests, not because you want to take advantage of this believer. You're trying to create a friendship so you benefit from this person or you have some ulterior motives. That's not the reason. You're doing so purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to what the Imam alayhi salam states. The Imam says, the one who does this, وَكَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ سَبْعِينَ أَلْفَ مَلَكٍ يُنَادُونَ فِي قَفَاهِ أَنْ طِبْتَ وَطَابَتْ لَكَ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will assign 70,000 angels who will walk behind you and they will all unanimously make this declaration that, O oh, believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made paradise available for you. This is the reward that a believer achieves by visiting another believer. Imagine the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has truly opened the gates of paradise wide open for us. But we're the ones who are constantly rejecting the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by not fulfilling these obligations. Then the Imam says this will continue until he goes back to his house. The angels will make this call and declaration. In another hadith, the Imam السلام, states, وَكَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِكُلِّ خُطْوَةٍ حَسَنَةٍ Every footstep you take in visiting this brother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will record a good deed for you. وَمُحِيَتْ عَنْهُ سَيَّةٍ Allah will forgive you a sin for every footstep. So if you walked 500 footsteps, let's say 100 footsteps, there you've just achieved 100 good deeds, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven for you 100 sins. Look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرُفِعَتْ لَهُ دَرَجَةً And Allah will elevate his status for every footstep. وَإِذَا طَرَقَ الْبَابِ فُتِحَتْ لَهُ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ And when he knocks at the door, or these days ring the bell, what happens? فُتِحَتْ لَهُ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ Allah will open the gates of the heavens wide open for you. Allahumma And another hadith tells us that if this person visits this believer, till one year after this visit, if this person dies, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold this person accountable for anything. وَأُفْيَ مِنَ الْحِسَابِ Look at the great reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising the believers. The sixth right that the Imam السلام, have emphasized is the right of shaking hands with the believers. Do you know how valuable that is, brothers and sisters? And Imam al-Baqir was once traveling with one of his companions. They were going from one city to another city. After the Imam السلام, disembarked from the camel, when they came down on the ground, the Imam shook hands with his companion. His companion told him, Ya Rasulullah, I was just with you on the camel. You were on this side, I was on the other side. Why are you shaking hands with me? 
The Imam السلام, told him, do you not know the reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the believers for shaking hands with one another? He tells him, what is the reward? He tells him, when two believers shake hands with one another and their hearts are positive towards each other, what happens? The hadith from the Imam السلام, says, their sins will drop from them just as the leaves drop from the trees during the fall. Another hadith which is truly amazing and mind-boggling. The Imam السلام, states, when two believers gather and they shake hands with one another, there is a third hand here that comes into play. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will insert his hand, symbolically speaking of course, meaning the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will encompass them. And Allah will shake hands with the one who loves his brother most. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. And the final hadith that I'll mention tonight is that the Imam says when two brothers not only shake hands but they embrace one another, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will brag about them in front of the angels. Allah will say, oh angels, look at my two servants. How they have created this love and compassion one another. My angels be witness that I will never punish them. And I will take them to paradise. A society that is based on brotherhood, on love and compassion will be a successful society. Will be a society free of many of the problems that we're experiencing today. On such a night, let us reflect upon the symbol of brotherhood, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salawatullahi alayhi. This amazing man who sacrificed everything in the way of Allah. He was a true brother to an Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. And Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Rahimallahu ammi al-Abbas. May Allah have mercy on my uncle al-Abbas. He sacrificed everything in the way of his brother Husayn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensated him by granting him two wings in paradise because he lost two arms in Karbala. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was a true brother to al-Imam al-Husayn. He lived to protect al-Imam al-Husayn. On the seventh day of Muharram, the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad, the army of Yazid, had now cut off the camp of al Imam al Hussein from having access to the water, to the river. Al Imam al Hussein السلام, tells his mother Abu al Fadl al Abbas, Oh Abbas, go and get some water. Do you not see the women and the children? They're crying. Abu al Fadl al Abbas, with 20 of his companions, he manages to break the army. He reaches the river. They get some water because some, a skirmish occurs. There is some fighting. They get some water for the women and the children. But it was not enough. They were only able to get some water. This was on the seventh day of Muhammad, the sixth or the seventh day of Muhammad. Now imagine three, four days without any water, without any access in the land of Karbala. In the plains of Karbala, the scorching heat, the scorching sun was causing these children to wither in that heat. On the day of Ashura, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas could no longer handle the situation. He walks up to his brother, Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. He tells him, oh Hussein, please allow me to go to the battlefield. The Imam tells him, oh Abu al-Fadl, you are the commander of my army. You are the holder of my flag, of my banner. How can I lose you? How can I allow you to go? Abu al-Fadl tells him, my dear Hussein, I can't, I can't bear this situation. I am hearing these children and the women crying and weeping, al-Atash, al-Atash, we are thirsty. How can I stand here and not do something for them? Please allow me to fight these evil people. 
The Imam tells him, okay, if that's the case, I give you the permission. But go, try to go to the river and try to bring some water for these children. Sukaina was begging Aban Fadl and Abbas for some water. She wanted to give her young brother who was an infant, Abdullah al radi he was withering. He was in the, in, in, in the heat of that day. He was struggling to keep himself alive. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he goes out to the battlefield. He manages to fight these evil people. He breaks the army. He reaches the river of Euphrates. He comes down from his horse. He enters the river. He feels the coolness of the river. He takes his hand with the palm of his hand. He carries some water. He brings it near his mouth, his dry mouth. And his heart at this point, as some narrations tell us, his liver, his heart was like an iron rod from the heat. He takes it, he draws it next to his lips, close to his mouth. He was about to drink the water when he suddenly remembers the thirst of his brother, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. He spills the water. How can he drink when his brother Hussein is thirsty? Ya nafsu min ba'dil Hussein huni O self, humble yourself For Hussein you have to be humble How can you drink when Hussein is thirsty? Wa ba'dahu la kunti an takuni Hada Hussein wa ardul manuni This is Hussein Embracing death. This is Hussein embracing death, and you dare to taste water? I swear by God, this is not what my religion teaches me. My brother is thirsty, and I dare to taste the water. I swear I will not do that. He had a container with him. He takes the container, he fills it with water. Now his only goal, his only objective was to take this water back to the tent. The children were waiting, all eyes were on Abu Fadl al-Abbas. Is he going to get the water or not? He embarks on his horse. This valiant warrior with so much courage, he fights the, 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 the army and he manages to break away from the river and head towards the tent. Uh, but on the way, one of the enemies, he was standing, he was hiding behind a palm tree. He realizes that Abel from the Abbas is crossing his path. He's going from this path. He, uh, he charges at him. He takes out his sword and he strikes his right arm. He amputates the right arm of Abel from the Abbas. Abel from the Abbas, at this point, he is holding the container with his, with his teeth, with his mouth, and he's holding his sword with his left arm. He says, I swear by God, if you cut my right hand, and me. I, I will not waver, I will continue defending my religion. He still had hopes of taking the water to the tent. Another one of those accursed enemies, he comes, he marches at him, he strikes him on his left arm. And he amputates the left arm of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He loses his sword, but the container is still in his mouth. He still had hopes of taking it to the women, to the children, to Sakaina, to Abdullah al-Radi. But then, all oh believers, here comes the street, here comes the tragedy. And one of those enemies, he takes out an arrow and he targets the bag of water that he was carrying. He shoots the bag and the water spills. At that point, he loses all hope. He has nothing to go to the tents with. 
And at that point, Jabal Fadl al-Abbas realizes that he cannot go back to the tent. What should he do? Imagine this desperate situation. And then another one of the enemies, he takes out an arrow and he shoots him in his eye. An arrow is now implanted in the eyes of Abul Fadl al-Abbas. And then the, the, the great tragedy comes when one of them takes out an iron rod and he strikes him and from him and a boss on his head. He falls to the ground. He calls out the name of his brother. He would always call him Imam Sayyidi Master. But this time he calls him Akhi. Alayka min salam. And Imam Hussein hears the cry of Abel from the Abbas. What happens? The Imam Ali salam like an eagle marches towards him. He comes close to the body of Abel Fadl al-Abbas. He sees him in that condition. Imagine Imam al-Hussein is love for Abbas to see him. The commander of his army, the carrier of his flag. He has no arms. There is there is a spear implanted in his eyes and his head had been shattered by the iron rod. These historians tell us narrators who were present there, they said, when we saw an Imam al-Hussain approaching the body of Abel al when he saw that scene, his back became bent. He could not walk upright due to the calamity that he was experiencing. <laughs> At that point he tells him, my dear Abel Fadl al-Abbas, my back has been, has been broken, my dear Abel Fadl. The Imam approaches him. He sees Abel Fadl al-Abbas, the blood is spilled around him. The Imam sits next to him. He takes the head of Abel from the Abbas, he places it in his lap, he wipes the, the dust from his forehead, but Abel from the Abbas was struggling. He, he was trying to take his head away from the lap of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein tells him, My dear Abel Fadl, what are you doing? I'm your brother Hussein, why don't you allow me to carry my head? He tells him, My dear brother Hussein, now you are carrying my head in your lap. But in about an hour or so, when you are martyred, there will be no one, no one who will carry your head in his lap. I want to die like you, Hussein. And then he tells him, my brother, I have one request. Please do not take me to the tent. I don't want Zainab to see me in this situation. I don't want Sakaina to see me. I promised her to get some water. Please apologize to her on my behalf. And then he brings his final moment. Imam goes back to the tents, but everyone realized something was different, and Imam al Hussein al -Salam, did not look normal. They, they wanted to ask him, the Imam said nothing. He just came to the tents of Abu al Fal, and he dismantled the tent of Abu al Fal. Everyone realized Abu al Fal al Abbas had passed away. Zainab came out running to the battlefield, but the Imam -Salam, was there to comfort her. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun Wa sayyamu al-lazina zalamu ala muhammadin Ayyamun qalbiyan qalibun Wal-aqibatun lil-muttaqin Raise your hands and dua, brothers and sisters. On this holy night, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer our prayers. Allah has promised us with tears and broken hearts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill our prayers. Raise your hand and recite this holy verse five times together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-suhu Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'a 
ويكشف السوء أما يكشف السوء يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأحواله والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة تسبق الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد. الله.